on your situation and what you've been through in your life, and may or may not relate to this, but uh, you know, if you were the boss in a particular situation, whether you just happen to be the oldest sibling or a parent, or whether you're actually in charge of somebody in a workplace, uh, sometimes the job of being the boss is just as hard as any of the work that actually needs to get done. And wrangling people and uh, keeping them uh, on task is sometimes even harder than just going ahead and doing the task yourself. Uh, which is why I feel like it's sometimes easier to just get people out of the way, do something right yourself, but regardless, <coughs> we still have people who end up being in charge. Uh, David was in a lot of situations like that throughout his life where he was uh, in charge of some difficult people. He was betrayed a few times and he was uh, undermined in others. By outsiders, but regardless, he always seemed to have an uphill battle. Even here at the sort of last chapter of his life, David is struggling against um, some forces uh, that are trying to um, take over his authority, and uh, the one man in particular wants to make himself king. So as we look at the situation where um, David is going to actually hand the reins over to his son Solomon instead, as he had promised to Bathsheba, we're going to look at a few points that I believe we can apply to our lives as Christians. Starting in the uh, beginning of chapter 1 here, uh, verse Kings, this, the Bible says this. Now, King David was old, advanced in age, and they covered him with clothes, but he could not keep warm. So his servants said to him, let them seek a young virgin for my lord the king, and let her attend the king and become his nurse. And let her lie in your bosom, so that my lord the king may keep warm. So they searched for a beautiful girl throughout all the, all the territory of Israel, and fell Abishag, the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful. She became the king's nurse and served him, but the king did not go happy with her. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen, with fifty men to run before them. His father never crossed him at any time by asking, Why have you done so? And he was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. He had conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and Abathar, the, Abiathar, the priest, following Adonijah, and helped him. Then Zadok the priest, Benaiah, the son of Jedoiah, Nathan the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and the mighty men who belonged to David were not with him. <coughs> and the night just sacrificed sheep and oxen and fatlings by the zone of Zoheleth, which is in the, uh, which is beside in Robo, and he invited all of his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But he did not invite Nathan, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah, the mighty men, and Solomon his brother. So one of uh, David's sons here, um, one of the youngest, um, has decided that he wants to get his faction together and make himself king. And he's made sacrifices to the Lord uh, in order to sort of elevate himself to that status. But he didn't get the approval of the Lord first, and he didn't get a, the approval of David. Um, so the uh, uh, coronation hasn't officially uh, commenced yet, uh, but he's making all of the proper preparations. Uh, so, uh, it says here that uh, his father did never cross him at any time by asking why could he done so. But given David's uh, condition, and it's not particularly surprising that he wasn't exactly on top of things. Um, he was so old that he had to have somebody uh, basically be a human hot water bottle for him to keep him warm enough. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a and kind of interesting the way the Bible frames this situation, but regardless, the responsibility is still on David as the king. Uh, just to talk about that young lady, I do think it's really funny that they, they went out of their way to make sure that they found a pretty lady to be with David. It couldn't just be anybody. I don't know. I mean, they, you know, they, you just needed somebody warm. There's plenty of fat old ladies or maybe fat old ladies. <laughs> Is that his authority and his position as king are being challenged from the outside. 
outside by somebody who doesn't have the authority to do so. The first thing that I want to point out about this may not be the most obvious, but I think it's one of the more important ones. David made the role of king desirable enough that somebody wanted to go behind his back and take it when he was done. I, now, when Saul was king, Saul was king for Saul's sake, right? And he really was trying to glorify himself uh, to make a position for himself and make history as King Saul. And David got the role um, from humble beginnings because God chose him to take that role and because of his attitude. And so he replaced Saul. So being the first sort of true king, uh, maybe not the first king ever, but the first one to start this line where his descendants will be king, David has already picked who his successor will be in Solomon. He already promised Bathsheba that this is what is going to take place. So, when we're looking at this situation, and we're looking at how it went from being something that it was, there was a civil war about, Saul and David fought about, but now David's made such an opportunity that his family has different factions that want to take his place, there is something interesting that we're going to see unfold here. You know, um, the position he was in had glory attached to it beyond just David himself, right? Because if Adonijah was just respecting David and just wanted to do what David wanted, he would have gone and asked David, said, hey, you know, I'm going to become king, get you on board with this, I've done all the right things, you know, here we go. But instead, David had elevated this position to something that was had some glory and some honor to it, where people desired to take on that task. Now, for us, uh, not being kings, uh, more than one of us can take on that role. So, it's a good thing, rather than a negative, for us. If you go out and do the job of being a Christian good enough, other people are going to want to take your place to be a really good Christian, too. Because you're going to glorify God and glorify the role that you fill in such a way that people will see the benefit of it. And they will want to succeed in the same way you have. And luckily for us, it's cooperation and not competition. So we can actually take what ended up being a negative for David and turn it into a positive for us. David had worked so hard at the task he'd been given by God that he not only glorified God through it, but he made the task itself one that was desirable and other people wanted to take on. I, I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of times where I want to be in charge. There's a lot of times where it had to be, but it's not a role I take on easily. Uh, I, I don't very easily deal with uh, difficult people, by which I mean I've got a little bit of a temper sometimes. <laughs> so I'm not a good boss because I'm not always good in a tough uh, situation where I have to make hard choices. Uh, and I think a lot of us, for different reasons, perhaps, fall in that same situation. Uh, so when we're looking at the job we have as Christians, and our role in trying to get people to recognize what our relationship with God is, we're at a great benefit. Because I don't need somebody to tell me how to be a Christian. I don't need a boss, right? somebody over me, and I don't need uh, somebody to come work for me so I can boss them around as a Christian. I need co-workers, I need collaborators, I need cooperation. So we have a great benefit that David did not have in that regard. He, he couldn't spread the authority of the, king, of the king around, but we can absolutely share the authority of the Bible and its teaching with one another, as we should. And, you know, there's a lot of other times in history where we look at somebody doing their job for God, where they weren't actually doing it for the benefit of the person that they were serving, but rather for God himself. I mean, think of Joshua, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are guys who took on a role that they were not necessarily ready to be eager to do for their boss, but they had a higher calling. And that's the same way we are as Christians. 
Uh, and specifically, in Colossians, when Paul is talking about our role as Christians, just a couple verses here from Colossians 3, uh, in, starting verse 22, he says, Slaves, so not a position that we thus are in, but slaves, in all those things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with the eternal serv external service, rather, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of your inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he's done, and that without partiality. So, you know, we're in a very similar situation as the slaves in a lot of uh, regards, in, in the sense that we're not necessarily working towards an earthly goal, when we do our daily tasks here on earth, but instead for a heavenly one, and it's for God's glory that we do the things that we do. Continuing on, we're going to see a, a, this, this unfold in a very particular way that I find remarkable. Verse 11, Then Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Have you heard that Adonijah the son of Haggad has become king, and David our Lord does not know it? So come, now come, Please let me give you counsel and save your life and the life of your son Solomon. Go at once to King David and say to him, Have you not, my lord, O king, sworn to your maidservant, saying, Surely Solomon your son shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become king? Behold, while you are still speaking, they are speaking with the king, I will come in after you and confirm your words. So Bathsheba went in, and the king in the bed, to the king in the bedroom. And the king was very old. Abishai the Shunammite was ministering to the king. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then Bathsheba bowed and prostrated herself before the king, and the king said, What do you wish? She said to him, My lord, you, you swore to your maidservant that the Lord your God is saying, Surely your son Solomon shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Now behold, Adonijah is king, and now my lord the king, you do not know it. He has sacrificed oxen, fatlings, and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king, and Abiathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army, but he has not invited Solomon your servant. As for you now, my lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on me, to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will come about as soon as my lord the king sleeps with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon will be considered offenders. Behold, while she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. They told the king, saying, Here is Nathan the prophet. And when he came in before the king, he prostrated himself before the king with his face on the ground. And then Nathan said, My lord the king, have you said, Adonijah shall be king after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down today and sacrificed oxen and fatlings and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the king's sons and all the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest, and behold, they're eating and drinking before him, and they say, Long live the king Adonijah. But me, even me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jedoiah, and your servant Solomon, he has not invited. Has this thing been done by my lord the king? And have you not shown to your servants who, who should sit on your throne, my lord the king, after him? And King David said, Call Bathsheba to me. She came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king bowed and said, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my life from all distress, surely as I bow to you, let the Lord, the God of Israel, say, Your son shall, Solomon shall be king after me, and he shall, shall sit on my throne in my place. It will indeed, I will indeed do so this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the ground and prostrated herself before the king and said, May my Lord the king live forever. So we'll pause there for just a moment. What I wanted to point out to you as we looked at this next part of the passage that we just read is that David was in a situation where he had achieved what we were just talking about a moment ago. He got co-workers and collaborators and people who were going to work with him in the service of the Lord. You'll notice that the first person to come and approach Bathsheba and to sort of start this is Nathan the prophet. Uh, there was someone who was working in the servants of the Lord, someone who was working for God directly, that uh, David had taken care to cultivate as someone who was an ally of him, 
and who had been appointed by God to also do that in the same regard. You know, Nathan wasn't always David's favorite person, especially when it came to Bathsheba, right? I mean, Nathan is the guy who came to David and said, you just killed a man and took his wife, and that's Bathsheba. And uh, it really broke David's heart. I'm sure Nathan wasn't his favorite person after that. But at the same time, he knew that he really had the best interests of God's people at heart when that exchange took place. And for that reason, Nathan is still a uh, trusted advisor of the king up to this point. And so when uh, Nathan and Bathsheba both come before David and, and deliver this news, he knows who he can trust. And more importantly, he knows who is on God's side in this situation, that uh, they're both really looking for uh, God's will to be accomplished here. They, they mention the Lord by name when they say that uh, this oath that uh, David made was before the Lord. And this was a promise that he made to God and to these people uh, too. So David goes on to uh, start the process of the coronation Solomon, and that's what we'll read about now. And King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benai the son of Jedoiah, and came into the king's presence. The king said to him, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have my son Solomon ride on my own mule, and bring him down to sit with Gaia. Let Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, anoint him there as king over Israel, and blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne to be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. Then he had the son of Jehoiah answered the king and said, Amen. Thus may the Lord, the God of my Lord, the king, say, And the Lord has been with my Lord the king, so may he be with Solomon, and make his throne greater than the throne of my king, Lord the king David. So Zadok the priest, David the prophet, then he had the son of Jehoiah, the Cherethites, the Pelethites, went down. And had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. Zadok the priest then took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. They blew the trumpet and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, and all the people who were playing flutes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth shook at the noise. Now Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished eating. When Joab heard the sound of the trumpets, he said, why is the city making such an uproar? And while he was still speaking, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest, came. Then Adonijah said, Come in, for you are a mighty man for good news. But Jonathan replied to Adonijah, No, our lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has also sent him with Zadok, the priest, David, the prophet, and the the son of Jehoiada. Je that guy. And the Cherethites, the Pelethites, they have made him right. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gaiman. They made him come up from their rejoicing, and there so that the city is no more. This is the noise which you have heard. Besides, Solomon has even taken his seat on the throne of the kingdom. Moreover, the king's servants come to bless our Lord King David, saying, Maybe your God make the name of Solomon better than your name, and his throne rather greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself. The king also said thus, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted one to sit on my throne today while my own eyes see it. And all the guests of Adonijah were terrified. And they rose, and each went on his way. And Adonijah was afraid of Solomon. He arose and went to hold of the words of the altar. Now was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon. For behold, he has taken hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Solomon said, If he is a worthy man, not one of his hairs will fall to the ground. But if wickedness, wickedness is found in him, he will die. So Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar, and he came and prostrated himself before King Solomon. And Solomon said, Go to your house. The finishing part of this story, Solomon's coronation, really uh, puts a cap on what we were talking about here today, and what I wanted to emphasize for all of us. David had this really important task from God in being the king of Israel. He had a task which he was also tasked with passing on to someone directly. Um, 
as king, his, one of his sons had to become a king, uh, along the order of things. And Solomon was the one who had been chosen. But all the way through this, uh, they relied on the Lord. Nathan the prophet brought the news of Adonijah's uh, usurping of the throne. Uh, they anointed Solomon in the proper way before um, the tent of the Lord with uh, the oil from within the tent. Uh, they made him uh, king uh, before the priests. Uh, they made him officially king in God's sight through all of these things. And uh, the blessing that everyone who had heard of this good news gave was made God made the name of Solomon better than David's name, right? The people recognized that it was God who was being exalted through this, and not David and not Solomon. It was the, all towards uh, the Lord. And that's especially encapsulated in what David said there in verse 48. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has granted one to sit on my throne today when my own eyes see it. He prayed to God and thanked Him for the opportunity to see His kingdom continue and God's will continue to be done in His people. And furthermore, even Adonijah, the opponent of David and Solomon, recognized the authority of God. And, and in this moment, chose to do something that relied on Solomon's faith in God and uh, God's faithfulness uh, as well. He went and grabbed hold of the horns of the altar to ask for forgiveness. Now, of course, if someone is touching the horns of the altar, you're not going to be able to shed human blood on that sacred place. You can't kill someone while they're holding onto the horns of the altar. That's just not acceptable. So, the promise was made to Adonijah that his life would be spared if he would conduct himself in a righteous way. Uh, the way Solomon puts it is, if he's a worthy man, he will live. Not one hair of his head will fall around. Uh, but it was going to be up to Adonijah to see that that uh, mercy from the part of the king was upheld because uh, Solomon's authority to execute him was still there in place if wrong it would happen later. But I wanted us to cover this part as well, in particular, because whatever task we've been given by God was given to us by the authority of God. We carry it out by the authority of God, and we pass it on to others so that they can continue it by God's authority as well. If at any point God wants to stop doing something, He will, uh, you know, get rid of the people who are doing wrong. Uh, he will appoint new people to do something right. He's going to take uh, charge in himself uh, for ending uh, certain things, just as he would later on end the, the line of kings uh, with Jesus, the one and only king. There doesn't need to be somebody else to replace him and rule over Israel. Uh, there doesn't need to be another priest now that Jesus is our high priest, but he has taken on uh, the roles uh, of authority over us, which rely, uh, relieves us of a lot of the problems that we might have if we're trying to take uh, authority and uh, tasks upon ourselves, right? Because as I stated earlier, and as we read in Colossians, the work that we're doing is not to ourselves or even to other people, but to the Lord. So whatever task we take on, we are doing for God by His own authority. And he'll give us a, a time to start, and he'll give us a time when we can quit. He's the one who dictates the parameters of all those things. And as we cooperate with each other, as we look to our friends and allies we've made, just like Nathan uh, and the other uh, priests and uh, so forth, and that sheep over to David, uh, we are continuing uh, to follow all the pattern that God has set forth for us. And finally, to go back to the first point we made, all of the things that we're doing are not for ourselves, but for God. And as long as we're exalting God through the things that we do, through our role as Christians, through that task we take upon ourselves, um, and that God gives us, uh, we are continuing to uh, make that God job that much more appealing 
and make the role of being one of God's people uh, something that other people want to take on. I hope this has been something that's been encouraging for you today and something that you can uh, get something out of, uh, especially uh, since I feel like we don't get to spend a lot of time in our spiritual history and looking at the example of, of the lives of the kings. Uh, Solomon and David both are really exciting figures. A lot of really interesting things happen in their lives, both good and bad. <laughs> they're, they're both full of equal amounts of good and bad examples. Um, very human uh, figures in the Bible. Uh, and uh, perhaps in the future we can spend some more time studying those things. If you do need to follow the example that's been set 